got so caught up in the music this morning, I forgot to turn on the Facebook Live. Isn't it a blessing to have the Bluegrass Battleship with yes. us? So during the sermon this morning, I'm going to be making reference to the seven principles. And if you are new to this church, new to Unitarian Universalism, and you don't know what the seven principles are, or if you've been here for a while and need a refresher on what the seven principles are, here's where you can find them. If you open up your gray hymnal and you leave sort of six turns in right after the preface, you'll find a page that has on the top of it these like all uppercase, all caps, Letters, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote. And then the seven principles refer to the first kind of the top third of that page, the, the paragraph that includes seven sections, begins with the inherent worth and dignity of every person, the first principle, and ends with the seventh, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And it's that uh, seventh one that I'm going to be talking a lot about this morning. Also, to kind of get into where I was going with the first part of this sermon this morning, you're going to have to use your imagination, because at the first service this morning, we had 40 visitors, 40 youth and youth advisors from First Parish in Belmont, Massachusetts, and so I want you, they were, they were sitting kind of where, where Marnie is and where John and Ruth Leopold are. So I want you to imagine that whole section with 40 youth and youth advisors. They're down on their spring break and um, they're actually going to New Bern to do a service, um, having to clean up from the hurricanes and the flooding there. They're doing a week of service. Last night, they slept in the manse. All 40 of them. <laughs> which is a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> so that's why I, I mentioned them, that they were here, because their presence, as I wrote this sermon, got me thinking about that that was the area where I, where I grew up, not the same town, but we both grew up just a few miles down the road from Walden Pond in Concord. And for, for us, for them, and for me growing up at Walden Pond, Walden Pond was something you do on Saturday afternoon if you're bored. But for you new high school students from most of the rest of the country, Walden Pond is where you go at the end of your coming of age experience. It is a culminating experience to go and see all the Unitarian and Universalist historical sites, including Walden. So one year, many, many years ago, back when I was a a student minister, I took a coming-of-age group from Texas to Walden Pond. And it was a beautiful June day. We walked around the pond, and we were all having a great day. This was very early in my ministry, and as we completed our, our circuit around the pond, I had this idea. And I said, hey, if, if anybody wants, I'll bless you in the name of your favorite Unitarian Universalist principle, while sprinkling you with water from Walden Pond. And I had no idea where that idea came from. And now that I think of it, it probably wasn't liturgically orthodox, but that's okay. But I tell you a story only to say, only to say, that the 10 or so coming of age youth who were on that trip, they all said, sure, that sounds fun. And I said, well, what's your favorite principle? And they all, to a person, said, the seventh principle. That was the principle they all choose. I would like to invite you to reflect for just a moment on that seventh principle. Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. What images come to mind? What does that principle make you think of? You, you minister, Reverend Ian Forrest Gilmore, says this. He says, our seventh principle 
Respect for the interdependent web of all existence is a glorious statement. Yet, he says, we make a profound mistake when we limit it merely to an environmental idea. It is so much more, it is our response to the great dangers of individualism and oppression. And it is our solution to the seeming conflict between the individual and the group. He continues, our seventh principle may be our UU way of coming to fully embrace something greater than ourselves. The interdependent web expressed as the spirit of life, the ground of all being, the oneness of all existence, the community forming power, the process of life, the creative force, even God. That idea can help us to develop that social understanding of ourselves that we and our culture so desperately need it is a source of meaning to which we can dedicate our lives. And so what I'd like to do this morning is to talk about that seventh principle in a couple of different ways, historically, but also theologically. Now, I want to tell you the history, I'll get to the, which is, I, I would get the boring part of it first, about how that term came into being. It's kind of a remarkable story. You may have noticed from the pages at the front of the hymnal that the seven principles are actually part of the bylaws of our parent religious organization, the Unitarian Universalist Association. So yes, I did bless those kids in the name of a bylaw. <laughs> <laughs> and these seven principles, along with all the other verbiage you can find on that page, were adopted democratically by a vote of the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly in 1984. In fact, the section below the principles, the sources, were changed 11 years later in 1995. So if your hymnal was printed before 1995, it contains only five sources. And if your hymnal was printed after 1995, it contains six. So we don't even know, well, we're not even all looking at the same page in this, uh, in this group. The seven principles, by the way, can be changed. They were changed and they will be changed again. In fact, if you, if you passionately believe that one of those principles ought to be removed, or if you passionately believe that an eighth or a ninth or a tenth principle should be added, there's a democratic way for you to make that happen. You'd have to get a lot of people to agree with you. But, but you actually could <coughs> rewrite the seven principles and ask our association to adopt it. Isn't that cool? So something very interesting happened in 1984. And I'm not going to be on the history for that much longer, don't worry. When the principles were first adopted in 1961, there were only six of them. Those six are not exactly the same, but very similar to the first six that you find in your hymnal. But in the early 1980s, there was an extensive effort undertaken to revise and rewrite the principles. And there was a great deal of consternation about this rewrite. Before 1984, even though there were like six principles written there, Unitarian Universalists didn't talk about principles. They didn't like them. They were actually kind of, the writing of them were not really that interesting. And then, as they rewrote them in 1984, there was a lot of consternation and people kept looking at them and saying, something's missing, it doesn't feel right, eh, I don't like it that much. And then more or less out of the blue, on the floor of the General Assembly, someone stood up at a microphone and suggested, what if we added a separate <coughs> principle? Respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. And everybody went, aha. And a little wordsmithing later, we had the seven principles, and people were very happy with them. What was it? What was it about the seventh principle that caused everyone to embrace it? What was it about the seventh principle that made it the universally favored principle among those coming of age youth from Texas, getting washed in the waters of Walden? I have an idea why. <clears throat> All of the other principles, beginning with the first, imagine a world made up of individuals. 
The other principles more or less deal with the worth and dignity I have as an individual, the rights I have as an individual, and how as an individual I'm supposed to interact with other individuals, whether that's person to person, in a church, as part of a world community. But the seventh principle is different. It begins with the idea of connection. It conjures up the idea of a reality where I exist only in interdependent relationship to all that is. There is no me without everything. And it's also the only principle that makes reference to anything beyond humanity. It's been suggested that the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part, is the only principle that can be explored scientifically. How am I a part of the web of all existence genetically, evolutionarily, <coughs> ecologically, and environmentally, cosmologically, gravitationally? It's been said that the seventh principle is the only principle that includes quantum mechanics. <laughs> and at the same time, that it's the only principle that can be explored from that scientific perspective, it's also the only principle that can be interpreted as making a reference to God or spirit or higher power. It's seen as both our most scientific principle as well as our most spiritual principle. Which brings me to the title of my sermon this morning. Which I realized I pronounced wrong at the first service, but it was then corrected. <laughs> Never preach to a group of Unitarian Universalists because there's always someone out there who knows more than you do and will tell you what you did wrong. <laughs> always. <laughs> always. <laughs> but Mentakioisen is a well known phrase that comes from the religious thought of the Lakota peoples. And in Lakota, the phrase means more or less all my relatives. Metakyoesim, all my relatives. Chief Averill Looking Horse of the Lakota peoples says, this phrase has a bigger meaning than just our blood relatives. Yes, it's true, we're all one human race, but the words mean more than family, more than nation, more than even all humankind, it includes everything touched by spirit. The earth herself is our relation, and so is the sky, and so is the buffalo, and so are each of the two-leggeds and the four-leggeds, those that swim and those that fly. Metakyoisen refers to the interconnectedness of all beings and all things. We are all interconnected. We are all one. Turns out, though, that this concept is not just in the seventh principle and not just in Lakota spirituality. The Gospel of John includes it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Wrap your mind around that one. All my relatives, the Takyoisen interdependent web. The idea of interdependence is present in Jesus' central teaching. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. <clears throat> and she says that if goodness and service or hurt and harm that's done to any one is actually done to all. It's done. All my relatives, metakyoes, and interdependent web. And in Islam, there's a notion <clears throat> that Islam is not just practiced by human beings. A long time ago, uh, nearly as long as taking that coming-of-age trip to Walden, I invited a representative of the Muslim community to come speak to a group of Yuyus, and he talked about, I remember being very fascinated by this, he talked about how in the understanding of Islam, it's not just that Muslims practice Islam, but in their understanding, animals practice Islam, and trees practice Islam, and rocks practice Islam. That your, your dog and your cat, <coughs> and the squirrel, 
and the leaves on the trees are actually caught up in this oneness, that it is all. And in Buddhism, this idea of an interdependent web, this idea of Rintakyoesen, is present in teachings about mindfulness. There is a famous and devastating piece of writing by Thich Nhat Hanh, entitled, Call Me By My True Names. And I want to read just an excerpt from it. Thich Nhat Hanh writes, I am the mayfly, metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird which, when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am the frog, swimming happily in the clear pond, and I am also the grass snake, who, approaching in silence, feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant, selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am a member of the Polidoro, with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man dying slowly in the forced labor camp. Please call me by my true name so I can hear all my cries and laughs at once so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open. The door of compassion. Just to review, we've got the seventh principle, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. We've got from the Lakota, Metakyoisen, meaning all my relatives. We've got from Christianity, this idea that in the beginning was the word and everything that is came through the word. And we've got Jesus' teaching that whatever one does to anyone else, one does to all. We've got in Islam this idea that all of the natural world is somehow practicing Islam together. And we have in Buddhism Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching that he is a part of everything cycle of nature, both birth and death, our suffering and our hurting. Seems like the religions of the world are all on to something here, doesn't it? What are we to make of this? I think it's true that these teachings, these ideas, call something out of us that is actually the best in us. An understanding that we are a part of a wider world, a world beyond borders, a world beyond divisions. In this time of hysteria and fear-mongering, and wall building. It is this idea, this idea that our lives are caught up in all other lives and in all of nature that is so needed. So let us go this morning heeding the words of the great poet Wendelin Brooks, <coughs> who wrote these words words that are similar to what you would find in Unitarian Universalism and Lakota and Christianity and Islam and Buddhism. Let us go heeding these words by the great poet Gwendolyn Brooks, who wrote, We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. So may And as the uh, battleship comes back up here, we're going to sing uh, a song of that. We're going to sing, May the Circle Be Unbroken. The words you're going to find in your order of service. 
And uh, I invite you to, uh, once they get playing, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit. We're going to sing out.